Welcome to It's a Long Road, the Ramble Series podcast. This is exciting because this episode is the first episode where we start discussing the film. Last episode on this feed, if you haven't listened already, I beg you, I implore you to go back and listen to the interview I did with David Morrell. But this is the first episode I am doing covering the films with a guest co-host. Let me just say, this guest co-host was my only choice for first choice to guess with me, and that is the podfather himself, the Slycast host himself, Mr. Craig Cohen. How are you doing? I'm good, and I apologize in advance for any stuttering I might have. It seems my internet doesn't like Discord tonight. Well, (laughs) Well, speaking of Discord, on the Ramble Series podcast, if you're listening to this podcast, I invite you to check out the show... Uh, what do you call it? the show notes? That's what they call them, the show description notes. In the show description notes of every episode, there is an invite where you just click on the link and it will lead you to the Last of the Action Heroes podcast network Discord server. And it, within that server, we record live, obviously. I mean, every recording is live, but you can join the recording, the live recordings with us as a guest member, as a guest, you know, sort of like a guest audience member. You don't come on mic or anything, you don't come on camera, but you get the crack wise with. Uh, me and my guest host, whoever it is at the time of recording, and offer your insights about the Ramble franchise. And today we have Donald, who is a regular, the other shows that we do on the Last of the Action Heroes podcast. He is a great contributor to the podcast with his insights and humor. He's been following Craig since his Camel Clutch podcast days. Welcome, Donald, to Discord. So again, I invite everyone to join our Discord. You can uh, join these live discussions. Well, Craig, I'm personally very excited to start covering Ramble. I have been looking forward to this journey for so long. I'm actually giddy. And that's a good sign. I'm giddy again. I'm excited again to podcast. You guys ever get that feeling when you start a new project? Oh, absolutely. And that, I mean, that's the reason you start something like that is because it's got your excitement levels high and your juices flowing and you want to be creative. This is a great set of movies to talk about. So I know people can go and I invite everyone to go to the Slycast podcast. Mr. Craig Cohen has actually interviewed before me and rightfully so David Morrell, the author. It's a great what was the 35th anniversary special to a first it was the 35th anniversary of first blood part two so we kind of talk about where david is with or was with rambo at that time his thoughts on part two and then also the unique situation which saw him writing the novelizations of those two sequels two and three which an author hadn't really done before so that's a great episode that 35th anniversary episode i'm really proud of it you were part of it Doug was part of it. Mike Kunda was part of it. We got listener fun. comments all around. Yeah, that's on the feed here. And then also, if you go back to the early Slycast episodes, we did a joint First Blood and First Blood Part 2 episode, and we also did a Rambo 3 episode. Yes, yeah, so please check those out. Craig, as always, does a wonderful job dissecting, talking about, well, all the Stallone films that he does, but particularly the Rambo films, the Rambo franchise, and I hope to do... Half as good as you do, Craig, and talking about these films will be longer. <laughs> longer isn't necessarily always better. So I'm really hoping that my series, though it will be longer than your coverage, it will have the same quality of coverage that you've done on Slycast. The beauty of you know what you were doing with Going the Distance and Now It's a Long Road is Slycast, we were doing two and a half, three hour episodes at some points. You're going even longer sort of over the course of a season. So- it really allows you to explore sequences and things that are worth talking about. It's awesome. You can never have too much coverage. Oh, good. Well, we're going to have too much on this podcast feed. I can't wait. So check out this show and all the other shows on the Last of the Action Heroes podcast network. Just Google Last of the Action Heroes podcast network, and you'll get all the shows that are available on that network. A lot of great action movies and action heroes. Craig, in a nutshell, because we're going to have new listeners. I think there's new listeners listening to us just because it's a new Rambo podcast. So people might not have heard your take. What does Rambo mean to you? Oh, wow. Rambo was really sort of my cinematic entry into modern action movies. I'm not entirely sure that in 2022 we can consider Rambo an action movie. I'd almost wonder if it's kind of more of a thriller, would you say? For me, I saw it at an age where... You know, it was on the cusp of of all those classic movies coming out. And it almost feels like First Blood is a good bridge between the 70s action adventure movies and what we got in the 80s. And then, of course, First Blood Part Two took it to the level that everybody sort of aspired to. 
for me, it's really sort of my cinematic entry into modern action adventure films. It's a character that I've been on the ride with ever since. Sadly, it didn't end the way I would have preferred it to end. And who, who knows if it's even over. There's great things about it, about each film. And I also think the character himself was important. The idea when First Blood came out and when David Morrell wrote the novel 10 years earlier of how these soldiers were impacted by the Vietnam War mm. and what they saw over there and how they were treated when they got home. History has appreciated those veterans alive and killed in action and missing in action a lot more. Since First Blood came out, we got the big wall in Washington, D.C., the, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And I'm not sure if this film helped turn the tide or not. I mean, after First Blood, you got a lot of Vietnam movies as well. I mean, of course, Apocalypse Now kind of started things, but a couple of years after this, you had Platoon and Full Metal Jacket. It's interesting. Rambo is a very, very important character to me, and I almost feel if I had to choose a side— if I was caucusing, I would probably fall on the Rambo side as opposed to the Rocky side. Yeah, I mentioned that in my trailer episode, so to speak, of what to expect from the series, that there is a Stallone crowd of uh, fans that there are people who, now you're not quite like this, but there are people who are Rambo fans that aren't Rocky fans. And I was fully expect I'm going to get listeners of this podcast who haven't heard one lick of my Going the Distance podcast. In fact... I've got some fan mail right now that I'd like to read. And I say, oh, sorry, look at fan mail. Look at me. I got fans already. <laughs> we haven't recorded a full episode yet. Well, I got a couple of emails already. If you want to send an email, and I'll read it to the listeners on the show, send me an email to Rambo Series Podcast. That again is Rambo Series Podcast at gmail.com. And already I got two emails from that introduction episode that I did. One is from a listener that I had from Going the Distance, the Rocket Series podcast. He's our favorite German. His name is Patrick Mintel. He says, hello, Ryan. Just wanted to tell you that I'm very much looking forward to the Rambo Series podcast. I will be there all the way. And I love all the five movies, all for different reasons. I think that's fair. I, I feel the same way. And maybe we get another Rambo film with Sly. You never know. And that's true. <laughs> we just never know. He says here, quote, it's a long road. What a great title you came up with, Ryan. Or was it a guy from Germany in an email from November 23rd, 2019, who wrote, quote, P.S., are you still planning to cover all the Rambles after Creed Part 2? And what about It's a Long Road, the Ramble Series podcast as a title? End quote. Now, wow, that's very specific, Patrick. I'm wondering if you're trying to insinuate that you're the one that gave me that idea. And yes, he was. I think I put out on one of my podcast episodes when I was talking about doing this podcast with the with, during the Rocky time, saying I don't know what to call it. And Patrick, yes, full credit to Patrick Mintel. For better, for worse, Patrick, it is your title's name. I loved it when I saw it. I'm like, oh, I can't believe I didn't think of it. But you came up with the idea. So I love the title. It's, it kind of fits with that going the distance moniker. And so that's why I loved it so much. So thank you, Patrick, for that. Oh, awesome. Yeah. He goes on to say that he won't charge me for that. Well, it's good because I don't make any money off this. He goes on to say, by the way, when I turn 50 years old in five years, I guess in, he's 45 now, my family and I, together with another family, are planning a trip to Canada. My buddy and I will definitely travel to Hope for one or two days to visit the First Blood locations. Hey, Patrick, I don't know if you knew this. I'm just a few hours drive away from that yeah, ferry ride as well. So if you want to visit me and while you're in Canada, come say hi. We've got five years to plan that, so no, <laughs> no rush. He says, so let's start walking that long road over the next five movies and 37 years. There'll be one hell of a journey. Cheers from Germany, Patrick. Thank you so much, Patrick. That's amazing. There's a movie that came out within the last couple of months called Antlers. I believe it's here on HBO Max here in the States, but it's my understanding that was filmed in Hope, British Columbia. Oh, probably. The Pacific Northwest here in BC is beautiful for those type of films. If it's atmospheric type, I don't know the film, but I, do you know that Rocky, Rocky himself saw the film, but he referred to it as Rantlers. <laughs> <laughs> a little Rocky humor. Well, <laughs> that's a deep cut for our Rocky Five fans. Boy. If you're like, what's Ryan talking about? Then you are not a Rocky fan. Okay. The second email is from Mr. Mark Crane. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the journey of the Ramble Series podcast. I'm 99% sure he didn't listen to my going the distance. But if I'm wrong, let me know. Because he says, hi. He just says, here, my first film I watched on VHS was First Blood. He goes on to say how this happened was his mom rented two movies, Elephant Man and First Blood. He thought First Blood was a horror film, so he chose that based on the title to watch and now it's his favorite film is first blood it says here really looking forward to listening thank you well thank you mark and i hope that i do 
First Blood justice to your fandom of the movie. I think it's great that your mom rented the film. And I will say, it was actually my parents that rented the film, too. That's how I saw it at a young age. It came out when I was seven years old, or just shy of turning seven, actually. And I, of course, didn't see it in the theaters. But I saw it on VHS myself. Probably, I was about, I would say, between nine and ten. I probably saw it on home video. First Blood was one of a handful of movies that I was ultra excited about when DVD became popular. I was an early adopter of DVD. I bought a first generation player. For those that didn't live through it, VHS was a struggle. Yeah. You had what was considered, especially for movies like First Blood, which is a very wide ratio film, pan and scan, where they would crop the film and then they would create these artificial camera pans to make sure they captured all the action. First Blood was like that. Die Hard was like that. I remember those were two movies that I was so amped to get on DVD when those came out because I knew we were going to finally see nice, beautiful widescreen images that people saw in theaters. It just got released a few years ago on 4K high def. And so I owe it to myself. I got them on Blu-ray, the box set, of course, but I I really do need to buy the 4K. And I'm going to be one of those guys that, yes, every time it comes out a new edition, 4K, 8K, 16K, I'll probably keep buying First Blood. Do you have a 4K player? Like, do you have a 4K Blu-ray player? Okay. The only Blu-ray I have is the director's cut of Rambo, which is part four. All the others I got in that, like, steel tin. Right, yeah. Um, when Rambo came out, I think. Okay. I haven't seen a box set yet. I could be wrong. I haven't seen a box set yet. That with has, Last Blood. With Last Blood. Is there one? There must be one. Uh, you know, I don't know. Were they all the same studio? Good question. We'll have to save that for season five of It's a yeah, Long Road yeah. <laughs> Rambo series. Yeah, a little Stallone trivia regarding my Blu-ray history. Please. The Expendables was the first Blu-ray I ever bought. Oh, nice. That's a good question. Yeah. I'd have to think about my first Blu-ray. Boy, I remember my first CD. <laughs> I don't know why I remember that. First CD I ever bought was Aerosmith Toys in the Attic and Aerosmith's debut album, Aerosmith. Mm. Uh, yeah. Anyways, a little side note there to get to know your host a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. We're going to talk a little bit, Craig, if you don't mind, before we get into the film, because we're, we're going to go through the film piece by piece, scene by scene, or moment by moment. That's how we're going to do this podcast. So we're going to play the sequence, and you, the listener, will hear bits and pieces. You're not going to hear the audio unedited, so to speak, because there's moments where the audio would mean nothing to you. There'd be explosions <laughs> or rabble falling out of a cliff. Playing that audio for an iTunes listener does them no good, but we will watch that as the guest host myself will watch that sequence and then talk about the things that we saw. But because, Craig, this is the first episode of the series, would you mind just joining me a little bit of talking about some of the... This isn't going to be anything revolutionary. I'm not going to say very much that people aren't going to be like, really? It was filmed in Hope, BC, in British Columbia? Yes. You know, like, I'm not going to say too much that people aren't going to already know, but I think a couple beats might be worth mentioning. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And okay. and also, I don't know if and when, or I haven't heard your discussion with David yet, but if you got into at all some of the differences between the book and the movie, I think most people listening to this know it's based on a book. Well, here's a little behind the curtain. Right now, we're recording before my interview with David, so maybe some of the things that Craig and I are talking about now might sound redundant, but again, some people don't listen to interviews, so I guess it works either way. Uh, people are like that. Some people don't like interviews. Yeah. You just finished reading the book, right? Three quarters of the way through, I'm interviewing Mr. Morrell two days of this t- from this recording, and it will be done. So we could talk briefly about the book, and I don't mind doing that since that is the genesis of this character. I mean, I think yeah. the main thing is in the book, it takes place in Kentucky. It's one of a handful of books I've read multiple times, but it was yes, not it was. Madison, like, Kentucky. That's right. Yeah. So it takes place in Kentucky. So that's a, a location swap out they did. And, and I don't believe in the book. It's not like a Kentucky winter or anything, right? In the book, it's fall. It's crispy at night. Yeah. They're cold, but there's no snow. That I, if I remember correctly, yeah. but definitely the elements are uncomfortable for Rambo and, and the gang. The people are cold and wet. There's a there's a lightning storm and rain and flooding and what have you. So it, it's not nice weather right now in the book. The other thing that we should let people know is the changes that Stallone made to the book made the movie the movie that it is. It made it connect with audiences the way it did. In the book, you get. Alternating chapters devoted to Rambo and then also Teasel. And you get a lot more Teasel in the book. In the book, Rambo's a psychopath. <laughs> he kills a kid in, in it. Pre-Madison, Kentucky events with Teasel. Yes, he hunted down a kid and killed him in his car because he slighted him on the street. Yeah. St- Stallone, when he sat down to adapt that book, 
Yeah, I mean, he sat down and read that book and said, I can't right. put this character on screen. Audiences aren't going to connect with somebody like that. And I think that's one of the great, great choices that Stallone made. And, and I'll go to the mat for the book, and I'll go to the mm -hmm. mat for the movie. I'm a fan of both, and I understand why they made the changes they did, and by no means am I like a purist in saying you need to right. – they should have straight adapted the book. I do know that within the last couple months, Quentin Tarantino talked about wanting to adapt First mm -hmm. Blood. He was more joking when he said it. I'm sure he would approach it in a different way than Stallone did. There's a lot of great material in that book, and if you're at all a fan of Rambo, I know you can get used paperback copies cheap, as David Morell will tell you when you interview him. It's never been out of print, That's which true. is amazing. There's not many authors that can say their books have never been out of print. So that means... You can go to the Barnes & Noble and order a brand new copy of First Blood in 2022. You don't have to go to your used store. It's also available on Kindle, which is how I read it when I reread it. I don't even know what my point was. Uh, but, <laughs> it's uh, okay. We're gushing about First Blood, the novel. I mean, if you're if you're a fan of the movie First Blood or the Rambo series, I think you owe it yourself to see or read and experience the source material. Now, here's the thing. It does differ from the movie or the movie differs from the book, but – Rightfully so. They're two different mediums. And this was also yeah. a film of the 80s. And you have to keep that in mind. Audience-pleasing movies were different back then. This movie could be made today like the book. I think having – spoil or should I spoil – I mean, do I spoil a book that that's, was written in 1972? is 50 years old. Am I allowed to spoil the well, ending? I think most people know about the alternate ending to this movie, which was the ending of the book. Well, the end of the book, Troutman shoots Rambo. In the movie, he commits suicide. Yeah. That was the alternate ending. Now, I'm getting mixed sources, though. I'm hearing Sly, though that ending was filmed, I'm hearing Sly didn't like the ending, period. So they had it recut or refilmed. But I'm also hearing Tess audience didn't like it or are both true. Well, that gets to how Sly set up the character. He's provoked. They drew first blood. Right. So if you look at the movie, he's not the psychopath from the book. He's a guy that just wants to get a hot meal and go through town, and he's pushed. He probably could have reacted to it differently, but this is also a guy that was trained to do what he does. He explored that in the other movies, and he explored that brilliantly in part four. His reaction shouldn't surprise anybody, and it doesn't surprise Colonel Troutman. <laughs> What's really cool about this is that the book and the movie are very similar in tone. The character of Rambo is actually very true. Like Stallone's performance is amazing in First Blood. Yeah, I think it's. I think I, the, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, you're the host here, Ryan. No, uh, that's fine. Uh, you're the guest. <laughs> I'll be here the whole series. You go ahead. Yeah, hopefully, I get invited back. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> no, I think another major point is David Morrell wrote this in the early 70s. Vietnam was still ongoing. The character yeah. of Rambo was younger in the book. Yeah, and also he was looked at by the people in the book differently as well. But I agree with you in the sense that Stallone did capture the essence of it. And I think overall, the essence of the book is yes. there. Not to plug my other shit, but on this network feed is an episode of a show I used to do called Big Screen Book Club, where we talked about Die Hard and the book that inspired it called Nothing Lasts Forever. I'm a fan of both of those as well. And I think the movie works as a movie and the book works as a book and they both work for their reasons and i think the same thing can be said of first blood is first blood's a great book and first blood the movie is a great adaptation of that book other filmmakers would approach it differently if they made an amazon sort of original of it and made it an eight episode series right. it would be different we wouldn't be doing the show right now if stallone didn't sit down and write the script for first blood the way he did and create a character that audiences can get on board with and sly knows how to give audiences what they want and he doesn't do it in a cheesy pandering way it's always just him knowing how audiences think and how audiences respond and what they want to see that's what he did with rambo and that's the reason that they made more rambo movies and that's the reason we're talking about rambo in 2022 to me it's amazing that he created two iconic characters most people don't even get to create one iconic character, let alone two. That's pretty remarkable. Have you seen the alternate ending? Um, I believe it's on the set I have. And it was also part of the 
montage in Rambo 4. It might be the director's cut. It's been a while since I've watched it, but you actually see the shot of Troutman, I think, going for the gun. So you actually see the blast. Again, it's been a while since I watched Rambo 4, and I can't remember if it's theatrical, the director's cut. I'm pretty sure that the set I have has the deleted scene as well. You can just go on YouTube, guys, listeners. If you haven't seen just put a uh, first blood alternate ending, and you'll see... Uh... I don't really spoil it. You can watch what was filmed. It's there to it's there to watch. Uh, Rambo dying by the hands of Colonel Troutman. It's kind of a combination. I would say murder suicide per se, but it was yeah. like Troutman's uh-huh. holding the gun, but Rambo squeezes the trigger, and you'll see. That's the reason Kirk, Kirk Douglas left this movie. He was originally supposed to play Troutman. Do you know why he was upset about the script or something? I know he wanted more screen time. Was that all? He, or? he wanted to. He wanted to kill Rambo. I think he just wanted to kill Stallone. <laughs> <laughs> He wanted a live round in that bullet, and they told him, no, sorry, uh, Mr. Douglas, <laughs> these are fake rounds. That you're not killing anybody, and he left in a tizzy. Okay, yeah, so he left. Richard Crenna was a last-minute addition to the film, and boy, can you picture anyone else playing Troutman than Crenna? Oh, it's one of those things where you always say it's it's great that things happened the way they did. Right. I'm sure when they were in pre-production of that movie and they had the quote-unquote true creative differences with Douglas, that nobody felt great about it. 40 years later, you watch that movie, and it's Richard Crenna's performance. I don't know if what you did when you read the book, but when I read the book, I picture Richard Crenna. <laughs> yeah, and I'd actually just picture a younger Rambo, because they really do a good job. And Well, they. Mr. Morrell, the author, does a very good job of describing this young kid. And you can't help but see the character as a young kid in the novel, but I still just see a younger Rambo or Sly's version of Rambo. It's just easier to see his image uh, running around. Speaking of casting... Brian Dennehy uh, playing Teasel. Boy, uh, he won a powerhouse. With those three in this film, I mean, absolutely all three of them, every scene they are in is just scene stealing, amazing um, stuff. The book, again, gets more into Teasel's sort of Korean War backstory. It's a great read, and there's a reason that it's been in print or never gone out of print, and that David Morrell is a working author. He's got a lot of books out. First Blood's not the only movie that's been made out of his material. But what's crazy, so, though, is it was the first book he wrote or got published. Yeah, yeah. What a way to start your career. Hey, I'm just going to write this book. Shortly, the rights to the novel, I should say, were bought shortly after the publication in 72, I think the same year. And it changed hands from different directors, from, uh, I mean, some names we know, Robert De Niro, and Clint Eastwood were both asked to play Rambo in the 70s. I can see Robert doing the 70s, not so much Clint. Sidney Pollock was asked to direct. It was attached to it. John Badham was asked to direct. Frankenheimer was asked to direct. So all these different names went through it. But it finally fell into the hands of Mario Kasser and Andrew G. Vanya. And, of course, Kasser is a huge name in producing. Vagina is dead, right? He passed yes. away a couple years ago. He, uh, unfortunately, did pass away. But Mario uh, Kasser, he's only, well, only, he's 70. So he... And he started the stuff young. Check out some of his producing and executive producer roles. Now, of course, we reviewed Escape to Victory. He did that one. Other movies that he produced were Terminator 3, Lolita, Chaplin with Robert De Niro. But then check out some of his executive producer. I mean, this is where you put the money where your mouth is type producing stuff. So, of course, First Blood, Part 2, of course, Ramble 3, Red Heat. I'm just doing ones that we would like on this network. Total Recall, Air America, L.A. Story, The Doors, Terminator 2, Basic Instinct, Universal Soldier, Cliffhanger, Stargate, Showgirls, Terminator, The Sarah Chronicles television show, Terminator Salvation. My goodness. Yeah. And he's younger than Sly, which is kind of wild. It's crazy. Also, still alive. I've never made an attempt to reach out to Mario, and I've never also made an attempt to reach out to Ted Kocheff, who is the director. A fellow Canadian and, for me, because David Morrell's Canadian as well. Yeah. And I believe Ted Kocheff, or Kocheff, is more of a, like a TV guy. Most of his credits are TV. I don't know much about that, to be honest with you. He's 90, I think. You can say what you want about the aesthetic of First Blood. It's a very raw movie. Everything in it looks real, because in 19... 19- the early 80s, late 70s, they had to do everything for real. There was no right. way to fake it. What I wanted to get to, and I think that's a problem with some of the more modern action movies, is they don't get guys like Ted Kotcheff to direct these movies anymore. You get a right. Mick G or a Michael Bay, and those are guys that don't care about the talking scenes. Right. They just want to watch shit blow up. One of the main reasons that First Blood works as well as it does, and why I wouldn't really call it a straight-up action movie is because of the approach that Ted Kotcheff took. could also say Stallone's script, but 
they just don't approach these movies like this anymore. There's something very special, very unique about First Blood. When I was younger, I probably remembered Rambo First Blood Part 2. I think I remembered that one the most for many yeah. years. And then it wasn't until I got a little bit older, late teens, early adulthood, when watching First Blood, I recognized, boy, this isn't, isn't quote-unquote just an action film or not as action-y as Part 2, but this is a great film. When I spoke to David, we kind of came to the conclusion that Rambo 2 is the Rambo that everybody knows. That's yeah. the Rambo that became an icon. It's like Rocky and 3 and 4 in some ways. Yeah. Exactly. The parallels are impossible to avoid. People that discount Rambo, it's the same people that discount Rocky. Right. Rocky and First Blood are, are special movies. Their respective franchises have been looked at in a certain light because of the movies that came after them. No, Rocky won Best Picture. Yeah. I think Stallone should have won an Oscar for First Blood. I think he should have been nominated. And I think he should have won. I agree. There's something about that non-speaking acting and the, the physical acting that is nothing to slouch at. Physical acting is a real thing, and we're going to talk about those beats as we go through the film in, the, in this season, season one, where we cover First Blood. I mean, we're going to hit on production stuff as we go through the series, too. I don't want to do all necessarily in one episode. I want to kind of hit some beats with other people. Yeah, so based on the novel by David Morrell. Again, check out the interview I did with Mr. Morrell. I am going to try to reach out to Mario's team to see if he'll be willing to talk. I think his uh, job as a producer, basically him getting this film financed, was a huge part of uh, the success for, both for Mr. Morrell's career. One other name I want to mention before we start watching things, and I think you hear him before anything else, and that's Jerry Goldsmith and the amazing score he did for this movie. It's the parallel path that Rocky and Rambo have taken, but I mean, Jerry Goldsmith's score, score is just as important and as powerful as Bill Conti's score was for Rocky. Both Bill Conti's Going the Distance was the name of my Rocky podcast, and and of course, Jerry Goldsmith's It's a Long Road composition yeah. is a name for this. So I just kind of found that interesting that it happened that way, but yeah, go ahead. The fact that the themes and the motifs that Goldsmith created, he scored two and three, and then Brian Tyler, when he picked up on part four, he used a lot of those themes and those motifs. It's like the Bond theme. It's not something that you can, right. you have to recognize it. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree. The uh, First Blood score, Jerry's uh, score is in theme music is just amazing. In fact, we're going to get into it pretty shortly right now as we cut to the movie itself and we're going to hear Jerry Goldsmith's theme. What is interesting about the beginning of this film is how peaceful it is, how quiet it is, and it really is the calm before... The storm. I love that acoustic work there. Are you singing along? Tell me you're singing along in your head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're all singing the song. When they drew first yeah. blood. There's a really good special edition of this soundtrack that was released that you can probably still find online. I just love the acoustic guitar. Yeah. It's a unique approach. Now, I should have gone back just a little bit here. We've got the first blood lettering. I really love the lettering of the first blood. It's got the red with the white outline. Yeah, that font is great. So what we have here, folks, we have the opening sequence here of first blood has hit the screen. And of course, actually before first blood, you got the big Sylvester Stallone in first blood we would be remiss if we didn't say the huge movies that rocky one and two were before the coming out of this film that without stallone's interest in the script that was a huge part that made the movie of course what it was and its production to go greenlit was of course sly sign on saying yeah i'll do this yeah oh yeah absolutely uh, so this movie cost 14 15 million dollars to make in uh, 1982 wow that's it that's amazing that seems like a risky budget in 1981. Today's money. So this film was greenlit today. Today's saying here's $42 million to make a film. That's, you know, for an yeah. independent film that has no CGI, let's say, some very small <laughs> set pieces all in the force. Yeah, I guess it's kind of a healthy budget towards the star, director, composer, and a budget enough where you're nearing half a million maybe where you're like, okay, we better make some money. And money it made. So it made $156 million in 82, which in today's money that's a 434 million dollar box office hit on a 40 million dollar budget so it made a hundred times its money back yeah that's global right that's that's... global and it was the number one selling movie 
in China <laughs> until 2018. <laughs> Oh wow, and then some Marvel movie probably. Yeah, took the title. I think I think it was Endgame. Yeah. Endgame was 2018. Yeah, yeah, is that amazing? It is. It sold the most tickets ever in China alone. I, I find that incredible. Every time I see the word China, I hear Trump's China. <laughs> Don't you? I hate Trump. He's either ruined China for you, or he's made it more fun. I think he's made it more yeah. fun for me. Back to the film. So we got Richard Crenna's name has come up, and we see Rambo walking down this gravel driveway. Brian Dennehy. Yeah, Brian Dennehy's there. Now it says Bill McKinney and Jack Starrett. I forgot to see who those guys were. They're probably the other cops, the older cops, because then we've got the red-haired guy from NYPD Blue. Jack Star- Starrett or Starrett, I don't know how to pronounce it. He's the guy with the mustache, right? Galt. That wants to shave him. Galt. Yeah. Now, yeah. here's an interesting thing. I th- This might be fun to talk about right now, and I'll mention it again when I get to his episode with Galt's introduced on screen, but Galt was killed in the jail, yeah. he was the first death. Yeah, Rambo slit his stomach open with a razor with the razor knife. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. And again, that's a change Stallone had to make in order, you know, to have people be on board with him. Yeah, we're gonna see the other two credits now for the guy from Miami Vice, Michael Talbot. You yeah, was? you remember uh, Rico and Tubbs? They had the two other cops, Zwitek and Zito. Oh, <laughs> I totally forgot. My- Michael Talbot was Zwitek. That is crazy. Oh, he's sixty-seven now. I think what we'll do though, Craig. Is when we get to the actual characters on screen, we'll kind of hit their yeah. beat, hit their beats. But sure. uh, yeah, but those are the names, and the rest of the names I'd have to Google anyway. So, but when we get to the characters, I can't remember the red-haired guy's name. That's David, name Crusoe. That. David Crusoe, David oh, Crusoe, David Crusoe. Come I on, Mr. Mr. Michael Talbot. Before I remember <laughs> David Caruso, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But David Caruso, he went on to great fame, of course, with CSI Miami, where in every episode he'd take off his glasses. Isn't that how? They- yeah, he was like a meme. He was one of the first memes, probably. <laughs> Taking off the sunglasses. There he is, David Caruso, yeah. Right underneath Elf. (laughs) Elf Humphreys. (laughs) Okay, so we see uh, Rambo walking down the driveway. He's wearing that army veteran-type jacket. The book, he also carried a sleeping roll with a a rope, so they kept that as well. Now, this whole sequence here, what we're going to watch, Craig, did not happen in the book at all. Again, this is 10 years later. I think we were starting to see the fallout. They were starting to have discussions about Agent Orange and what it had done to some of the soldiers coming home. And it's alluded to here that the cancer that he gets is because of chemicals he was exposed to while in Vietnam. And that's the question I maybe I have for you. Now, we know it's interesting. The book took place or was published in 72, and the war was still on for another three years after the yeah. book was published. But this film comes out in 82, which is about, what, seven, eight years after the conflict yeah. ended officially. It's still fresh in the memories of Americans, but it could make sense that is this one of those things where we are watching the events of 82 here and not the events of 72 in the film? Is that how you're understanding that? Yeah, and I know our buddy Matt from Rambo Mania, or whatever his show is called now, has talked about the timeline of Rambo before. I think he falls on the side of it is the 70s, but I've always taken this as the movie takes place in the year it was made. Yes, I um, There's no information, well, aside from Stallone's age, to indicate that because if it did take place in 72 stallone would have been younger because what stallone was he's 36 uh, in this film yeah so that kind of makes more sense for his age he looks 36 which is yes he looks great he's in great shape but that would make more sense that the conflict ended 10 years previously let's say so he was 26 when the conflict was over that kind of makes sense he was you know five years in the vietnam war survives the war and he's still wandering the roadway so to speak you know seven eight years later and he's 36 now in the film I think timeline-wise, it makes sense, and I don't think it was uncommon for people to still wear their fatigues or jackets from the war, even in the early 80s. Well, that was his identity. That's all he had. Right. The reason why he's on this property, if you look at his face here, Craig, as he's walking down the driveway, he looks content and very happy, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think there's going to be a shot in a couple of seconds where he's sort of overlooking the property, and they do a a shot on him where it's a look of hope. I think he's excited to meet his friend who he's going to learn in in a few short seconds is dead. And that's what really is the first thing that triggers him. But it's heartbreaking almost to see the look on his face and the hope in his face and watching this movie now and knowing what happens, feeling bad, knowing what he's about to hear and experience. This is a great shot here. He's going down. It's a great camera shot choice where he's walking down the driveway. You hear laughter of children or whatever. A beautiful lake. Say what you want about the poor demise of Dalmar. His widow's got a great property. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 
think it's coming. Here's the oh, shot. Look at that shot there. Yeah. What a gorgeous yeah. shot. That's not a shot you saw on VHS. You you saw basically Stallone in his bag. <laughs> oh, because the widescreen abilities. Yeah, yeah. Good point. So he's looking at the is. kids. The yeah, look at that. That's the shot right there. He sees children playing. He's happy. It's kind of heartbreaking, man. I mean. Yeah. Ugh. When's the next time he made you laugh in the films or made you smile? In the Rambo series? <laughs> yeah. God, I don't, I don't know if he does. Well, yeah, in Rambo 3, when he tells that Afghani soldier about the light, it turns blue. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Rambo 3. I, you know, I can't wait to talk about Rambo 3. But Rambo 3, is the, it's the comedy edition of the Rambo franchise. It's the uh, last crusade of the Rambo franchise. <laughs> so they got five kids, eh? Five kids playing there. Mm-hmm. Andrew Laszlo. I believe he had a pretty long career, too, the, uh, the cinematographer. Oh, probably, yeah. Based on the novel by David Morrell. I don't know if you heard that because you're talking to the kids. Can you tell me if Dalmar lives here? I never noticed that before. I just listened to my earphones there. He goes, can you tell me if Dalmar lives here? That's a good point, Donald. says the amount of kids indicates that it's probably 10 years later. Oh, yeah, good point. Yeah, there you go. Good thinking. Yep. Dalmar was busy (laughs) pumping out those kids before his cancer. Oh, there's a guy hanging clothes with her there. I never noticed that before. Yeah. Did you? I did not. What in the world? Yeah. Is this like Mandela effect? Am I going crazy, Greg? <laughs> Let's see if they show him again. I mean, he could be one of the... Well, no, we already saw all the kids, right? Maybe there's more than five kids. <laughs> he could have had a son before he went off to war, and then that kid's older now. Well, I don't know who this gentleman is here. Uh, boy, this guy moved in awfully quick when Delmar died. <laughs> She's got needs, man. Come on. I've never seen that guy before. Excuse me. Can you tell me this where Delmar Barry lives? Oh, it's sorry. Oh, it's it's all, it's all. <laughs> okay, you have to keep in mind, people, this. <laughs> we're overanalyzing it too much. It's just a very tall teenage girl. They've got about five or six kids for sure. So the teenager, 11 or 12 year old, she's as tall as the mom. That just threw me off there. My apologies. Okay, that makes more sense. So she goes, he's not here. Go on inside, please. Oh, he's a friend of mine. As a matter of fact, he wrote this address down. Right here. There. You can see that's Delmore's writing. I'm sure I had a hard time finding this place. Yeah, that's his writing. Oh, like I said, he's a friend. Uh, my name is John Rambo. We served on the same team together in Nam. I don't know if you ever talked about me. I've, I've got a picture uh, of us together. Somewhere. <laughs> you know, Sly, what a great job he does here of just being quiet and, and humble, a little bit awkward. He's sensing this woman doesn't, maybe she doesn't trust me. Uh, maybe she doesn't want to tell me where Delmar lives. You know, maybe he doesn't live here anymore, but obviously Rambo wants to get information. But the way he says, you know, I've got a picture of us together, and you can see this is his handwriting. <laughs> She's like, I don't know what his handwriting looks like. and But just how he's got all this stuff. The, both the Rocky and Rambo characters both like to carry pictures in their pocket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and show people. <laughs> here. here it is. Here it is. That's me. That's uh, Danforth and Westmore. Bronson, Ortega. And there's Delmar right in the back. You had to put him in the back because he's so big. If he didn't, he'd... They're all he dead. The whole picture. Look how big he is. Delmar's gone. Um, what time will he be back? He died. What? Died last summer. Died how? Cancer. Brought it back from Nam. There you go. Cancer brought it back yep. from Nam. Did they use that orange agent? Is that what was that the war? Agent Orange, yeah. I believe Jesse Ventura, he claimed to have suffered from a lot of effects of Agent Orange. It affected his lungs, and he blamed a lot of health issues that he had on Agent Orange. Oh, really? Yeah, that's unfortunate. Again, I love Sly's act. I'm going to say this a lot throughout this series, but his acting, or at least this season, at least season one, his acting here is just so great of just, what? He died? Just the way he is and his how his face changes. And, and this is peak Sly, right? I mean, chisel yep. jaw, just features cut from stone. Hair. Yeah, great hair. Uh, old Regular ma- eyebrows. <laughs> This is, you know, there's no rug here. You know, this is real hair. I mean, he, he's kind of puffing the front a little bit to cover the receding, but it's it's there, though. It's it's all there. Mm-hmm. All that orange stuff that spread it around. Oh, there you go. 
cut him down to nothing. I could lift him off the sheet. Can we just say how great this actress is playing this very bit role? She just carries this yeah. opening scene. Yeah. I never got her name because I would be interested to see just kind of, you know, where they grabbed her from. Yeah. She might have just been a local, you know. This was filmed in Canada. No. What are you, what are no, you talking about? I'm saying. She, she might have just been a local actress in British Columbia, you know. Are you kidding? <laughs> Wait, you don't get my – I'm actually not even trying to be funny. There are no black people in There's British no black people in <laughs> 1982? All right. I'm, I'm actually pulling up uh, – On IMDb? IMDb right yeah, now. Yeah, sure. So please do. She's not listed on IMDb. Wow, uh, really? I mean, she's a big speaking part. I know. That is odd. Maybe IMDb servers are in British Columbia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Mrs. Barry, all right. Uh, thankfully, there's a Rambo dot fandom. Okay. She is played. It's not made clear as to whether or not she is Delmar's wife or mother. That's a good point, uh, because if he's young, maybe that was his family. He was the oldest one that left for war so he was the senior child but i think we're led to believe that's his spouse somebody here on rambo.fandom is saying i've been trying to look her up and see who she is she's not even in the ending credits so <laughs> what is I, she? I, <laughs> that is insane we might, have, we might have to solve a mystery here uh, this is a challenge to all my <laughs> listeners right now i need you guys i need detective work done right now because ryan has to get her on this podcast <laughs> Hopefully, Agent Orange hasn't taken her yet. <laughs> I never thought about that. I, I, you didn't see a female name in the opening credits, and I don't recall the end credits of this movie. I haven't really studied them too well. There might be a, a mystery in place. That's insane. That's actually crazy. This is fun. Okay, if you have the answers, hit me up on my email is Ramble Series Podcast at gmail.com or find me. It's a long road, the Ramble Series Podcast on Twitter. Look how beautiful that is. That's beautiful British Columbia, my friend. In fact, our license plates, that's what they says on our license plates. Beautiful British Columbia. It's just gorgeous. It's a beautiful province. Best province in Canada. Now, this is supposed to be Washington State, though, in, in the movie. I believe so. Pacific Northwest, yeah, yeah. So he hands her the picture. That's a great gesture. It's twofold. Uh, we find out later that Dalmar was the last of the survivors from his platoon or his troop. And so it's him letting go. Yes, exactly. So he's given the picture yeah. and he's basically like, I'm not holding on to this anymore. Everyone's yeah. gone. I'm the last one. That's survivor's guilt. She's the widow. I believe. That's why I believe she's the widow. You know, it could be the mother, but the age doesn't make sense. I would mean maybe Dalmar joined at 17 or, so, or 18, which is possible. Yeah. But the kids that she has right now are too young. That's why I think it's the wife. But whatever. Yeah. And his walk back slow, sauntered. And he throws the uh, the letter that Dalmar read him into the uh, fire pit there. And man, that is British Columbia if I've ever seen yep. it. Oh, boy. Yeah. So he's walking on the street, the highway there. His hands are cold. He's breathing on them. He's not hitchhiking, but he's he is looking at some cars as they, as they pass by. Maybe he's thinking about hitchhiking, but he, I haven't seen him put his thumb out yet. Yeah. That's a good point, Donald. Rambo is not sentimental. <laughs> Now, here we have a great sequence here of him underneath the sign. It says, Gateway to Holiday Land, Welcome to Hope. So, again, this is the real – that's really in Hope, British Columbia. I don't know if yeah. that's there right now, but that's a nice little slice of history. Like, that's what Hope, British Columbia looks like or looked like uh, again in uh, 1982. So, it's a nice little film history. And it's nice for me because, you know, people who are from Philly or they watch movies in New York or you in Las Vegas, you get to say, hey, that's why that's in my area. So, for me, this is my movie, you know, where – I can say this is my stomping grounds. This is uh, I wasn't raised in Hope, but I've been through BC so much as, as a province that I've been through Hope, BC many times. And yeah, it's just kind of cool to see this is my homeland, so to speak, for this film. Yeah. Now, we're going to stop it because the next sequence, of course, is uh, he runs into Mr. Sheriff Teasel. And Mr. Doug Greenberg from the Rocky Minute podcast, he and I will be covering that first introduction between Sheriff Teasel and Rambo. Lucky guy. You're the inaugural, though. You're the podfather. You yeah. came on the first episode. and I told this to Doug for Rocky Minute. I fear no minute, and the <laughs> same holds true for uh, the Rambo series. So anytime you need me, Ryan, scheduling permitted. It does help that we're both in the same time zone. I'm there, man. I'm not afraid to talk any scene in any of the any of the movies. And I told Doug I'll take the scenes in the Rocky movies nobody else wants, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll do the same here. That's awesome. 
this movie has a great setup. And I think that scene, it's not in the book, but I think it's an important scene to sort of set up the character, where he's at mentally. It tells a lot of story. Very little dialogue tells a lot of story. Yes, I totally agree, Craig. And thank you so much for coming on. So I guess that's it, Craig. The first episode is over. Nothing is over, Ryan. You don't just turn it off. Mm-hmm.